Good morning, clinical problem solvers. Thank you so much for joining us today on this another special Saturday because today, you know, we have pleasure of having with us an amazing program, the Mass General Brigham Selim Hospital. And Dr. Caroline has been kind enough to present a case to us. And I'm sure it would be a profoundly insightful and educational case. And before I pass the mic to Dr. Caroline to introduce herself, maybe, you know, I would like to say thank to all of our team members who are present today. So I can see the Rafa, I can see the Dania, I can see Dr. Thiago, I can see the Gabby, I can see Franco, Deborah, and lots of others whom I am probably missing. And even Dr. Rabi is here. So it's always a pleasure to, you know, have them in the background because I know that I can feel, you know, kind of wisdom permeating from them to us, you know, so like our thought process are better when they are around. And now, uh, Dr. Caroline, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like what to do outside the medicine, what kind of food you like, you know, hobbies and something like that. And then maybe you can begin the case. Thank you so much, Kirtan, for that lovely introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline. I am the current chief resident at Salem Hospital, which is part of the Mass General Brigham system in Massachusetts. Uh, Salem is about 30 minutes north of Boston, where I'm located now. And there's about two feet of snow outside my window. Um, I'm originally from the Dominican Republic, proudly so, um, and moved to the U.S. for residency. I was an IMG, um, and currently I am very much interested in palliative care, so I'll be doing a palliative care fellowship uh, come this summer, and I'm also very passionate about global health and, and global palliative care, too, so those are my particular areas of interest. Um, a little bit about our program, so Salem Hospital has a medium, you know, small to medium sized residency program. There are 25 residents, uh, all internal medicine, and then a couple of preliminary year residents that join us for our first year too. And I hope that you like the case that I brought today. It's a case that I actually took care of uh, my second or third week as a PGY2. <laughs> so if any of you are joining and you, you know that sort of transition point when you go from intern to PGY2 and suddenly you have to know all the answers that every, the, all the answers to the questions that people are going to bring you, uh, there's some of that anxiety that was definitely uh, found in this case for me. And I hope you find it interesting. Amazing. And I am, you know, in the chat, I'm seeing that we have many new faces today. Like I'm seeing Noah and he is like the PGY1 and I'm sure that he can relate with what you are telling the transition phase and I'm sure that their thoughts would be amazing in the chat and you know maybe before we start Dr. Ravi do you want to have any reflection and then maybe you can start. Kirtan is a master in making me blush um, <laughs> um, and uh, and even though he's done it many a time I still blush the same. Um, I, I can just tell you that um, um, whenever you have an international medical graduate who is also a chief resident that tells you the amount of distance traveled that Caroline has had and the amount of work that she's had to put in to um, be here in this space. And so um, kudos to you, congratulations for not only um, pushing very hard undoubtedly to be where you are, but also reflecting back and um, being there with your patients in the most intimate way possible as a future pride of care doctor, and then also being there for your community and returning the gesture with your focus on global health. Um, I can tell we have a um, uniquely talented um, person here with us. And I can't wait to get to know you better, your program better, and um, get to nerd out with the rest of the TP Solvers crew. Um, Kirtan, if you think there's anything wise in that, there's nothing. It's just um, just um, the joy of being here with you guys that I um, will sit here and um, and bathe in the awesomeness of this community. And also I see before he turned his video, oh no, it's on. The one and only Jack Penner is here too, to add to your list of CP Solvers team members who yeah. made it on a Saturday. Yes, that's always a treat, you know, like to have the check on any day other than when he is facilitating, you know, so it's always a treat. And also friends, as always, please share your thoughts in the chat and we would like to highlight every one of you. And maybe if you're not able to highlight, then we would definitely kind of, you know, echo the sentiment that you wanted to present. So please share your thoughts. And Dr. Caroline, please present the case whenever you are ready. All right, great. So bear with me, guys. This is the first time I, I'm doing this, but I hope that I'll, you know, be good. Um, all right, so the case I'd like to bring to you guys. So I have a 67-year-old female, no real past medical history that we know of, uh, who came into the emergency room at our hospital. Um, and her complaints were some shortness of breath and palpitations. And notably, uh, when she was being assessed by the initial nurse, she was found to be hypoxic and uh, required three liters uh, per minute of oxygen via nasal cannula to maintain a saturation above 92. 
and her heart rate was also found to be 148 beats per minute on vitals check. Sure, and Dr. Devin, you can let us know whenever you think is a good place to, you know, stop and do the clinical reasoning. Otherwise, you can give us a little bit more of HPI, whichever way you think is the best. I think this is a good point because I think you're you're seeing a patient who's coming in with very specific complaints and with data that backs up, you know, the the symptoms that she's feeling. Okay. So maybe this is like a good branching point to start thinking about what questions would be pertinent to ask someone who's coming in with this presentation. Yes, definitely. And you know, while you were speaking, we already have some thoughts tickling in the chat. And I guess the point that hands raises is very important. In any hospitalized patient, we have to think about that. So hands, why don't you unmute yourself and share your thoughts? I guess it's really important. Yeah, that would be an alarm uh, symptom. Uh, somebody coming in with shortness of breath, uh, high heartbeat. And, and then of course we can correct at least to some extent uh, the hypoxia with a nasal cannula and oxygen going above 92, so that would be a pulmonary embolism, but there are other things to consider. And what comes to my mind at this stage, not knowing her very well, maybe she has some infection as well, some problems with the heart, like a congestive heart failure, or even um, an MI, but there is no mention of a chest pain. But in women, we have to be very careful. They have atypical symptoms as far as MIs are concerned. So a PE was the first thing that I had on my mind. Yes, of course, we I also did. have a, a mm -hmm. dissection. Yeah, sure. I guess the point to raise is very important because you know those are the must not miss entities like myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, and any infection. And we know that in old age patient, and we still don't know the what medication patient is on. I mean, sometimes it can happen that patient can be on immunosuppressants and patient is not able to mount the immune response. So you may not get the classical signs of infections. So having that background in mind is very important. And you know, now Rafa has also shared some thoughts about that how we can link the palpitations and heart. So Rafa, if you are in a place where you can unmute yourself, then please share your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Uh, so here in the suburbs, when we're dealing with sharpness of breath, we usually think about the heart and the lungs. If I'm not mistaken, Razan once told us that 95% of the cases are actually related to those organs. And then, but when it comes to the palpitations, I was also thinking about other causes like a hypothyroidism, maybe that could also lead to um, sharpness of breath and the palpitations. And also, I was thinking when it comes to hypoxia and hypoxemia, it would be really good to know, like, uh, but this is just me thinking like if the, if the AA gradient is normal or, or it's elevated because we could have a true drug differential diagnosis, you know, so it would be helpful to know. Thank you. Sure. And I agree with you that when we are dealing with hypoxia, we have to ask ourselves, like the primary problem is with the heart or is it with the lungs, you know, like if the heart is not functioning properly, then you can get what is known as pulmonary edema. And that can also not correct well with the oxygen supplementation. So that is what we are dealing with right now. So maybe there's a cardiac issue. And then of course there is a lung issue. Like what if apart from fluid, we have collection of pus or collection of blood in the alveoli. So that is always important. And I also remember that on one of the RLR episodes when Rabi and Reza were discussing the case, they mentioned that how, you know, the arrhythmias can be triggered by so many other conditions. So like we have the evidence of palpitations. Now we know that it could be simple sinus tachycardia, but if it is indeed some kind of arrhythmia, then we have to find the underlying cause. Like, are we dealing with some infection or even sometimes pulmonary embolism can trigger the arrhythmia? And as the Rafa mentioned, hyperthyroidism can definitely contribute to tachycardia. And physical examination would be so important because we need to find out whether the patient has some evidence of you know, volume depletion, which is maybe contributing to tachycardia. What are other vitals like you know BP and how it is titrating later on to other fluids and medications? So we can find out whether we are dealing with shock or not. So I guess that would be very important. And before we move on to next helicopter, I guess Dr. Thiago has shared one of the most beautiful descriptions that I have, you know, possible think about thyrotoxicosis and anemia. So Dr. Thiago, please, can you share your thoughts? Nothing new, uh, Kirtan. I, I was just thinking that it's very common, this complaint of shortness of breath. I, I can think myself, sometimes I'm like, oh, in this COVID times, do I have COVID? So many times we ask ourselves, uh, 
am I breathing correctly? And so it's very common to see patients in the emergency room complaining of shortness of breath and it, it is anxiety. But in this case, anxiety is ruled out given it will it would not cause uh, hypoxemia. So this is a very important data that we can have as soon as the, the patient arrives because we can use uh, the oximeter. And uh, as Rafa well said, we should prioritize lungs and, and heart, uh, but also we should keep in mind that the, the differential here is really broad and uh, that are systemic diseases that could cause uh, the this, this symptoms. And uh, I just mentioned teratoxicosis as Rafa did, and also anemia. Uh, there are other possibilities like uh, autoimmune disease, they can present with inflammation and shortness of breath. So the, the differential is pretty broad, but I would uh, take a look at her lungs and, and heart for sure. I think we now have you know, enough data with us, like how to proceed. And we have already shared many thoughts and we have discussed everything. So now Dr. Kevin, why don't you share the next telecode and let's see where we can go from there. Yeah, you guys are doing great. All right. so. When you talk to the patient, she says that this sort of feeling of shortness of breath has been going on for about a month or two. Um, and she links it to the passing away of her son who passed away for sort of uh, unexpected reasons. Um, she's been feeling more depressed since then. And I guess some of these symptoms started around that same time. Um, she's also had a dry cough for this time too, which she describes as being non-productive, um, no hemoptysis that she's seen in the cough. Um, the reason why she comes to the emergency room today is because she was in France for the past two weeks visiting her daughter and her husband had stayed here. And when her husband picked her up from the airport two days ago after her return, he, she seemed to be much worse uh, than she had been before. And sort of he insisted that she come to get evaluated uh, at the emergency room. But otherwise, the patient is like almost like a little bit upset that the husband forced her to come. Um, she also endorses some significant weight loss in the past couple months. Again, since the death of her son about uh, two months ago. Um, and she can't say exactly how many pounds, but she just feels like her clothes is fitting much more loosely than it used to. What other history can I give you? She, um, so again, sort of as far as like past medical history that we have on the patient, um, she has been pretty healthy her life. She hasn't gone to many doctors, hasn't had the need. She currently takes no medications. Uh, family history was also non-contributory. Um, her son passed away, we think, from um, you know a substance use disorder, nothing medical uh, necessarily related, like a like a medical condition. Um, and uh, socially, she is a active smoker. She smoked about one pack per day since she was a teenager, so that would be about almost fifty pack years at this point. And uh, otherwise, you know, has a occasional alcoholic drink, uh, maybe once or twice a week, um, no other recreational substance use, and she does not have any allergies. All right. So do you think this is a good place to stop? Yeah, why not? Where, where, how are people thinking about the case now? Yes, I guess we have some nice thoughts coming regarding, you know, the social history, like how the dying of her brother has, you know, affected the things. So Nila and you had some amazing thoughts about how we can link the heart problem to this cough and dyspnea and everything. So do you mind sharing them? Oh, sorry, it's totally fine, Nila. You, you are a librarian, you are joining us. Thanks for joining us from library. It's always a pleasure. And let me see, yeah, Dr. Ravi Singh is kind of, you know, agreeing with Nilayan and kind of echoing the sentiment that Nilayan is presenting. So Dr. Singh, why don't you kind of share your thoughts? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I was absolutely agreeing with Nilayan. It's a great thought that he had, especially when Caroline presented uh, very, very eloquently about this patient having a stress. I mean, what could be more stressful than a son passing away, especially if you're a 67-year-old parent. So uh, if we follow this, this um, stressor in her life, it can manifest uh, with cardiac dysfunction. And, and a good example of that was what Nalayan was mentioning is 
is uh, Takatsuba, Takatsuba's cardiomyopathy, so which would be uh, uh, have a morphology on an echo with apical ballooning. And uh, as part of a workup of cardiomyopathy, such as that, you do an, uh, a cardiac cath and it would show clean coronary vessels. Uh, I believe also you'd have elevated uh, troponins in this case as well, and the, in the low EF, and the shortness of breath could be attributed to, to the cardiomyopathy. Uh, and also the palpitations, you, with, with any sort of cardiomyopathy, you could have disease myocytes, which could generate extra potentials, and that can manifest with PACs, PVCs, or any other arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation and so on, or atrial ectopy uh, or atrial tachycardia, any one of those. So an EKG and echo would be very helpful in this case. Yes, I definitely agree with your thoughts, Dr. Singh. Thanks for sharing that. And then we have Shami. Shami is, you know, sharing his thoughts regarding the weight loss. Like, of course, we have significant weight loss. So how to incorporate that in history, given the fact that patient also has smoking history. So Shami, why don't you share your thoughts? I think it is very pertinent to our case. Hi, yeah, I was just thinking with this history of 50 tech years and the weight loss that we are, that we are maybe considering um, a malignancy maybe a pulmonary malignancy that could predispose to a, to a clot burden and subsequent pulmonary arterial embolisms and pulmonary hypertension. This could maybe fit the picture together. That's just a thought. Yeah, sure. I think you are right. Sometimes, you know, pulmonary hypertension is one of those disorders which we often tend to miss because it's not always in the limelight like other disorders like, you know, COPD or interstitial lung disease. So it's always uh, nice to have pulmonary hypertension in the back of our mind. And uh, let me see in the chat. I think I missed one comment. Yeah, Kelly was mentioning about the malignancy and maybe associated with pulmonary hypertension. So Kelly, if you are in a place where you can unmute yourself, then would you like sharing your thoughts? Yeah, I was thinking because the age and the history of the smoking, uh, most likely a malignancy, and um, because it has a lot uh, long time of of this lost weight too. So, but at the same time, pulmonary hypertension can be a differential diagnosis, can be secondary. Primarily, is more in young people, uh, but it's in female. But secondary can be due to uh, something chronic like a COPD because the history of smoking too. Uh, so we have to really see the exam to rule out some other diagnosis. Sure. I think those are excellent thoughts because whenever we think of pulmonary hypertension, we you know, kind of divide them, like whether it is class one, class two, class three, and so on. So as we know that class two disorders are usually due to heart problems and class three are due to the lung problems. And in our case, since the patient has significant smoking history, it's always wise to keep that in my mind. And you know, while I was looking at the uh, history, I was also thinking, and what else smoking can cause, like apart from malignancy. So we know the patient has significant weight loss. So we have something known as, you know, COPD cachexia syndrome. Like it's one of those conditions which can happen in patients who have long-standing COPD and like very long smoking history. And they can present with weight loss and palpitations and everything. So we can think about, you know, kind of deconditioning and generalized weakness as we can see in COPD cachexia. And apart from that, other interstitial lung disease, like uh, let's say respiratory bronchiolitis associated ILD, even, you know, Langerhans cell histocytosis can present in smokers. So we have to think about all the conditions which can present with significant smoking history. And, you know, uh, I think this is one of those points where I would like to stop and ask Dr. Rabi's opinion, because like he can guide us well at how to proceed further. So Dr. Rabi, if you are in a place where you can unmute, can you share us that how we can, you know, make progress at this point in time? Oh, you know, my friends are doing it again. I have absolutely no input. Um, uh, to add to this beautiful conversation, I think you're teaching us about smoking with lung diseases and details about pulmonary hypertension. And I think the truth is that um, uh, I only start to think in more detail about a patient who is short of breath after the initial data comes back because the range of possibilities is so long. And I also know that everybody needs imaging, EKG, and lab work. So what happens in real life is you get that data immediately in the next hour, and then you start to think. So unlike uh, other complaints where you can, um, your workup is changed by what you're thinking, your workup for shortness of breath initially is unaffected by what you're thinking. You immediately have to do the same things every time. And those same things are a great filter about how to think next time. So in real life, shortness of breath, don't think too hard, do the initial workup and see where you're at. But for clinical reasoning practice, 
I agree with you. The smoking history is very intriguing here. The travel to France is very intriguing here. And the possibility of undiagnosed pulmonary hypertension is really important to consider. Sure. See, thanks for sharing that. See, this is what I was meaning. You know, like whenever I feel lost, I can always count on Dr. Ravi to guide us further. So now, Dr. Caroline, why don't you give us some more data regarding physical examination and maybe basic labs? And then we can see how we can make the progress. Great. Sounds good. All right, so um, before we got to evaluate her in the emergency department, uh, she had already been given two liters of saline, okay, as a bolus. And with the saline, her heart rate had come down minimally to the 130s, mid-130s. Mid um, and her oxygen requirement uh, had increased from three liters to four liters by the time that we examined her. Uh, so on her exam, her vital signs, just to complete them. So her temperature, she was a febrile, uh, uh, 36.7 Celsius or 98.1 Fahrenheit. Her heart rate, as I mentioned, was now in the 130s to 140 range when we saw her. Um, her respiratory rate was 18 to uh, 22 breaths per minute. Um, her blood pressure was ranging from 170 to 195 systolic over 80 to 100 diastolic. And like I mentioned, she was now on four liters nasal cannula to maintain an O2 sat of 91%. On exam, she didn't really appear to be in distress. She had sort of a depressed affect, was a little bit tearful, speaking in monotone, um, short sentences. Her cardiopulmonary exam, so her, her lung exam had diffuse uh, uh, and expiratory wheezing and prominent by basal or crackles um, up to maybe the mid lung fields. But there was no uh, accessory muscle use. Um, she didn't seem to be in severe respiratory distress. Her cardiovascular exam, she was tachycardic, but it sounded regular and there were no appreciable murmurs, no gallops, um, no jugular venous distension was appreciable, but she was examined while being sitting up almost at 90 degrees. Her abdominal exam, her abdomen was soft, no distension, no tenderness, no guarding, and bowel sounds were active, no organomegaly was appreciated. Her neurologic exam, she had intact cranial nerves. Um, her, sens her sensation was intact diffusely. Her motor strength was considered to be normal, five out of five diffusely. And her reflexes also seemed normal, two plus. We checked, um, we checked uh, patellar and uh, biceps. Her skin, there weren't any rashes that we could appreciate, no nodules. On her extremities, we did appreciate maybe trace to one plus uh, bilateral edema, uh, predominantly around the ankles. And yeah, that was her physical exam. As far as basic lab work, and you can tell me how basic or how advanced you want me to go. Um, her basic or comprehensive metabolic panel showed that her sodium was 144, her potassium was 3.8, chloride was 104, uh, bicarb was 28, her BUN was 10, creatinine was 0 0.4, glucose was 89, she did not have an anion gap with that. Her calcium was 9.9. .9. And then her CBC uh, or hemogram revealed that she had um, 4.5 thousand leukocytes with a normal differential. Her hemoglobin was 11.4 over a hematocrit of 36 and her platelets were 206,000. Sure. And uh, Dr. Kevin, I just wanted one clarification that the patient's BP was elevated. So like, was it a one-time thing or like it was elevated during the entire hospital course because patient has no past medical history of hypertension? Correct. And I think that this is something that we also encounter many times is patients will come in with being perfectly healthy or no past medical history. But, you know, if you don't go to the doctor, you can't get a diagnosis. <laughs> so we do think that she was uh, hypertensive and she did remain hypertensive throughout that hospital stay. All right, I think that's very important. Thanks for clarifying. And now let me see what we have in the chat. 
Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, let's see if someone shares their thoughts. And before that, I can share my thought that if we see that patient has edema on examination around the ankles and the patient has elevated blood pressure, so always we have to worry about the fact that if heart is failing, if liver is failing, or if kidneys are failing. So in our case, although we are not able to, you know, kind of evaluate like jugular venous distension in all the positions, but as of now, we can fairly say that maybe heart is functioning well, and we would get an echocardiography to see how heart is functioning and whether there is evidence of cardiomyopathy due to long-standing undeter undetermined hypertension or not. But another thing is that what if hypertension is secondary to renal failure, you know, like if there is something brewing in the kidneys for a while, maybe in the parenchyma, maybe in the vessels, and due to any reason, it can be due to atherosclerosis, it can be due to chronic parenchyma disorders, it can be due to glomerulonephritis, even obstructive uropathy, and all of those things can lead to hypertension, and it can also lead to what is known as, you know, flash pulmonary edema, like one of those things which can happen whenever the blood pressure kind of spikes up, and kidney disorders are one of those disorders which can cause the flash pulmonary edema. And our patient is, you know, kind of unstable, like the patient has high BP, patient is not setting well. So I would always, you know, like to make sure that uh, what is wrong with the kidneys, like maybe we can get an, you know, USG of kidneys to make sure that everything is fine. So as to further evaluate that edema. And of course, as we will get more data in the metabolic panel, we will be clarifying that whether the protein is low and well, whether there are other signs and signals which can point us to a particular organ system. And meanwhile, again, Sammy, uh, and even, you know, Rafa was mentioning about the vitamin B1 interaction and thiamine interactions and, you know, thyroid interactions. So Rafa, first, why not you share your thoughts regarding the thiamine and then maybe you can go to Sammy. Yeah, so I was thinking this post pressure is kind of a little elevated for me. So I was thinking like, what could be leading to increased post pressure? And every time I think about that, I think about like increased metabolism. So you produce more lactic acid leading to vasodilation. So you have like um, a heart failure with increased ejection fraction, right? So I was thinking maybe we're dealing with thyroid toxicosis, which could explain the hypertension, the palpitations. Um, maybe a vitamin B1 deficiency. I don't know, this patient must be, could be like um, depressed, but just a loss of her son, not, not uh, um, feeling well, and that would, could also explain the weight loss. So those are my thoughts. Yes, sure. And Sammy, do you think you can add something to it? Yeah, I was just uh, adding that the thyroid toxicosis can actually exacerbate a thiamine deficiency due to the accelerated metabolism. And um, thiamine is an important cofactor for pyruvate dehydro de dehydrogenase to circle um, pyruvate into the Krebs cycle. And yeah, that was just an anecdote i don't i don't know if it's present here um but it was just a thought sure and i think uh, thanks for you know teaching us the pathophysiologic basis of that and i think it's really important and you know maybe this is one of those moments where i can you know stop and ask dr caroline herself that like when she was dealing with the case what were you know her thoughts and the team's thought so dr caroline do you mind sharing us that what were you thinking at this point in time not at all. I think you guys are, um, you know, your thought process is amazing and much more sort of involved than I think the team initially was thinking of when we were seeing her. Um, whenever you see a patient, I think you're thinking what's most likely and what can kill my patient. And let me make sure that I'm not dealing with what can kill my patient before I try to pursue anything else. And so for us, um, you know, in the what can kill my patient box was definitely pulmonary embolism. Um, I will, uh, I don't know if I should share a little bit more information at this point too, to sort of explain a little bit more of our thinking. Um, uh, yeah, Dr. Kevin, if you think that it won't uh, reveal the final diagnosis, then please. Uh, okay, so um, to sort of help you think about it a little bit more, when we saw her, we had an, enough, uh, an additional piece of information, which was a chest x-ray, which I know that you guys were keen on getting. And the chest x-ray actually was also showing a spiculated nodule in the right upper lobe, um, which was described as concerning for possible malignancy. So with that in mind, we were, you know, dealing with a patient who has probable malignancy, um, probable lung cancer, given her smoking history, who had just come from a flight uh, two days prior, a long flight, who had hypoxia and tachycardia. And so PE was very high on our differential of, of things we needed to make sure that this patient was not having. 
Yes. Yeah, thanks for saying that. You know, now we have a better idea. Like you have given some beautiful insights as to how to move ahead. And before you give us next piece of data, I see that our dear friend Noah has said an amazing thought regarding, you know, VQ mismatch and hypoxemia. So Noah, if you're in a place where you can, you know, unmute yourself, do you mind sharing that and teaching us how to approach this pathophysiology? Uh, sure, of course, yeah. Um, so I, I think I've come across this as an intern uh, a lot, especially I'm going into night float during this during this storm. So I'm sure you're going to be called in a lot for it. But uh, generally, uh, in a hypoxemic patient acutely, I'm and they're not responding to nasal cannula, I think first, am I not giving them enough oxygen for their pathophysiology? Do they have a, a lung or cardiac disease that's preventing them from responding to three to six liters of nasal cannula? And do we need to in, like up titrate them to non-rebreather or even intubate them? Um, second is VQ mismatch. So likely here with the bivasal or crackles, we're thinking about a VQ mismatch etiology um, and therefore just oxygenation alone won't improve their hypoxemia. Um, and then finally, is there a reason why nasal cannula or another oxygenation method will actually prevent them from oxygenating properly? So do they have a nasal pharyngeal obstruction or they have tracheal stenosis or some abnormality that's gonna prevent that? Sure, amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Noah, we really appreciate it. And uh, now I think that we, of course, need CT and geography to make sure that we are not dealing with pulmonary embolism. And if even patient is stable enough, then maybe, you know, we can get CT scan itself of the chest to see like how these crackles can, you know, translate to the imaging studies, like the pattern of the ground glass opacities or any sort of fibrosis can guide us at how we can move ahead. And, you know, the malignancy part, always we think that, okay, we have the x-ray and we have the evidence of malignancy. So what next? So I believe that always it's wise to get CT scan. I mean, as I have learned from all my dear residents, that sometimes the CT scan can reveal findings which were not evident on initial X-ray. Like you see a small spot on X-ray, but maybe the patient has concurrent lymphadenopathy, like mediastinal lymphadenopathy, or concurrent fibrosis in the lower lungs. So that can you know guide you at how you can move ahead and whether we think that heart is also still contributing a little bit to it, and whether systemic process is going on or not. Because still you know we are not sure that how to fit malignancy into this general picture. We, of course, are worrying about embolism, but apart from that, we still don't have clear idea. So I guess those amazing studies would really guide us. So please, Dr. Carolyn, share what you your team did next. All right, guys. So we also got an EKG, just for those who might be interested. It was a sinus tachycardia with occasional uh, premature ventricular complexes, but no ischemic uh, patterns. Uh, no, no typical sort of the thing that we think of the S1Q3T3, which I think actually happens very uh, less uh, often than we would like to think for PE. But anyways, um, as we were, we were sort of thinking out loud, we said, yep, we need a CT scan of this uh, patient to rule out a pulmonary embolism. So we ordered a, a CT chest for PE and there was no PE. Um, but after she got her CT scan, the nurse uh, pages, pages us to come and evaluate her because her heart rate has now gone back up. She is now in the 160s and she's having a little bit more respiratory distress. And so they want us to reevaluate her. Um, the CT scan just showed uh, by Basler sort of ground glass op opacities consistent with some pulmonary edema. Uh, wow, this case is getting complex with each and every aliquot. You know, like we thought there is to be embolism, we tested for it. And now the patient is deteriorating. So of course, you know, first thing that comes to mind is we have to ask ourselves like whether the intervention that we did, like the CT scan and maybe the contrast that we administered, like was it responsible for this sudden change in the hemodynamic status or was it something all along and we were not able to identify it and that's why the patient deteriorated. So I think that's very important. And, you know, the premature pre ventricular complex series really kind of intrigues us. I mean, as Dr. Singh mentioned in the chat very early on, and as I was talking that I have heard in RLR discussion that sometimes these embolism and all other, you know, lung problems can trigger the arrhythmias and even electrolyte disturbances can be hiding in the background. They can contribute to arrhythmias and which can lead to recurrent deteriorating status. And uh, this is really a surprising case, like why the patient is deteriorating constantly. And I'm uh, seeing in the chat that if we have some thoughts, hmm, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Thiago, like, what do you think about this volume required to perform the CT and how, you know, you can guide our discussion? Can you share your thoughts? Here, Kirtan, you are very formal today with this doctor. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was just thinking that um, 
it looks like there is no acute problem in her lungs to uh, for us to think that 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 this is the reason she came to the ER. Uh, but look at at his heart because you know she has a tachycardia that we don't know why, but she's hypertensive and also she was uh, she didn't get better after volume. Actually, she got worse after volume, and uh, you know she had a CT, an angio CT. So she we have to worry about like anaphylaxis for sure because she had a contrast uh, and she's worse. But again, she had volume for her CT. So uh, I, I'm kind of thinking that she is not dealing well with volume. So it makes me think that maybe there's something going on in her heart uh, that uh, made her have this, this, this acute problem. So this is what is in my mind. Sure, I agree with you. Like as we were discussing earlier that it would be very helpful to get an echo, you know, because the patient has hypertension. And as Dr. Caroline told us, that sometimes the patient may have it for numerous years and we don't know its implications on the heart. You know, like if there is underlying hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is contributing to arrhythmias and causing all this pulmonary edema. And you know, the patient even had very high heart rate. So like sometimes we know that constant tachycardia due to any reason can cause what is known as tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. And there are you know, numerous other causes of cardiomyopathy. So we need echocardiography to kind of, you know, zoom in at what we are actually dealing with. And if the echocardiography is indeed normal, then, you know, we would be in a pickle, like how to proceed further, like everything is looking normal in the heart and how we can go further. But I think getting an echo would be really helpful. And let's see what that is. Um, so the echo was performed uh, two days after. <laughs> um, so I don't know if it would be you know, the, the way that I would uh, approach her case right now, it wouldn't necessarily be to jump to the echo, but you guys have been thinking about something else that maybe is like lower hanging fruit, which we could just check with some blood work. I don't know. Should I, re should I give like the, the no, diagnostic no, no, no. revealing it's, it's, information no, no, yet or not no? Now. Yeah, not, not, not now. We okay. can wait. Yeah, we can think more. Yeah, okay. we can think more. <laughs> yeah let's see what okay. the chat has to say. Yeah. You know, sometimes okay. it's difficult to check of chat and everything. So let me check in the chat if there are some thoughts there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, in chat, there are some thoughts about, you know, like what can cause these lung findings. So like, just Imran, maybe do you mind sharing your thought once regarding the lung findings? Oh, hello, everyone. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, before me, Noah actually uh, greatly summarized it that when we have the ground glass opacities on the CT chest finding, so we can approach it whether what is the content of that thing. So if it is like any kind of fluid, so you have to think that fluid is coming from, uh, is it a translative fluid because of the heart failure? Is it some kind of a pus or any kind of an inflammatory fluid because of any infection? Because a lot of bacterial viral causes can cause, cause such findings. And lastly, there was uh, something associated with the blood. And uh, Noah mentioned that there can be a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and blood can accumulate in alveoli as well. So this was the fluid causes. Then Rafa added something that protein can be there. And Dr. Singh also added that malignancy can be there. And I said that ILDs, the interstitial itself, if it is involved due to any causes, any kind of interstitial lung disease, interstitial pneumonitis, uh, we had a case of cryptogenic organizing pneumonia last week, any kind of interstitial involvement that can also cause the ground glass opacity. So just on the basis of the anatomical structure, as well as the content of that alveolar sac and the area, we can describe how to approach in ground glass opacities on CT findings. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, just when you summarized everyone's else thoughts and as well as added your thoughts. So that's, you know, less job for me now. So thanks for doing that. And of course, I agree with Dr. Caroline that yeah, maybe instead of jumping to echo, it's wise to, you know, get first the albumin levels, the kind of phosphatase levels, ASTLT levels, and, you know, maybe even repeat electrolytes and comprehensive electrolytes. Like let's get calcium as well. Let's get the magnesium as well, because we know that sometimes it can contribute to arrhythmias. So we can get that and let's see how it goes. And even coagulopathy like APTT, INR, because we are worrying about diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and other conditions which may lead to alveolar hemorrhages. So maybe that would be a wise thing to do. All right. So as far as her other blood work, sorry, let me just pull it up for a second. Um, so I believe I heard a request for calcium and magnesium and protein levels. So calcium was 9.9, .9, uh, magnesium was 1.9, uh, 
uh, albumin was four and total protein was around six. Her uh, transaminase levels, her ALT was 223, her AST was 203, her alkaline phosphatase was 118. She had a total bilirubin of 0 0.4 and direct was less than 0 0.2. And I believe I also uh, heard a request for uh, coagulation studies. So um, normal. Uh, I don't recall them entirely, but they were normal. Sure. Yes. And you know, meanwhile, we ponder over the abnormal LFTs. I guess again, I'm sorry if I'm you know uh, pointing you again and again, Dr. Rabi. But can you again you know share your approach? Like how we have to move ahead? Now we have evidence that patient is not improving on some of the therapies that we have given. And we have ruled out the embolism and we have some interesting lab findings. So do you mind sharing that how we can move ahead? Thank you. That's a very, very kind. I, you know, um, I think this, this case is very tough. I think um, if you were to summarize the pertinent abnormalities, you have a patient with infiltrates in the lungs, marked sinus tachycardia, um, and now new evidence of some um, uh, reasonable hepatitis. And um, I think you probably would reframe this as a systemic disease with prominent uh, thoracic manifestation. And the question is, where does the origin of the disease lie? And I think you're getting more and more data that it may lie in the belly. And the abdominal causes that you would need to explore would probably be efficiently explored with the CT scan. And the question is, how can they affect the thorax? And they can affect the thorax um, Primarily through Takotsuba's cardiomyopathy, a point that um, Ravi with the V, the better R, um, raised earlier. So my mind is thinking, I wonder if there is a devastating um, syndrome in the abdomen that accounts for the disease process that you're seeing in the chest, and the chest may represent a reaction to that. Um, but I also would reinforce the vigor for the possibility of um, hyperthyroidism, which is one of the two endocrinopathies under consideration here, with the other being potentially a theochromocytoma uh, in the abdomen causing this. So I think you started off with your anchor dropped in the chest, and I think you have to diffuse it to wonder, is the belly the source and the chest merely suffering the consequences of the belly? Those are my um, reflex thoughts. Sure. Thanks for sharing them. And I guess, uh, yeah, I actually missed that. In the chat, many people mentioned that they also wanted to get TSS, T3, T4, and BNP. So do we have that, Dr. Carolyn? Yes, and that is gonna reveal the diagnosis. <laughs> so her TSH level was undetectable and her free, to four, free T4 was markedly elevated. Oh, nice. And I guess, you know, very early on in the chat, we came to this diagnosis. I mean, I asked Dr. Thiago to share his thoughts and he, you know, kind of beautifully described that how thyroid strong can present in this manner. And if I'm not forgetting, I guess we have had uh, at least three or four cases of thyroid storm presenting as, you know, other complaints like presenting as fever, presenting as sepsis, presenting as shock, and now this arrhythmias and very critical hemodynamic status. So now we know that, you know, how thyroid is something which can kind of kill you. So it is very simple thing, but you have to be aware of that. And I remember now that another point which I raised earlier, that sometimes you get what is known as tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. And if I remember correctly, then we have what is known as dilated cardiomyopathy. And then we have subtypes of dilated cardiomyopathy, like what are the secondary causes of DCM. So always pheochromocytoma, thyrotoxicosis, and even acromegaly. All three of them are in the list for possible causes of DCM, either acute or chronic. And the reason is the same because sometimes when you have too much catecholamines or too much sympathetic trial, you can get tachycardia repeatedly, repeatedly. And you know, that can lead to cardiomyopathy. So I guess, uh, but I mean, even in this case, even if we had gotten the echo earlier, it may not have led to the diagnosis. So I agree with Dr. Carolyn's approach that we need to do the serological testing first. And again, you know, this highlights what the collective power of chat is. Like the Shami mentioned, the Rafa mentioned, the interplay of, you know, thiamine and the these TSH levels. So it's really amazing to see that how we can reach to the diagnosis as a team. And maybe before we move on to the chat and have some final thoughts, what about you, Dr. Kevin? How do you think that we could have approached this case in a better manner? And what were your team's thought 
when you diagnose this condition. I'm, I, I'm really impressed by sort of, again, the collective group wisdom. You guys said the right diagnosis within the first 30 seconds of me starting, and I thought, oh, man, they're going to get it right away. Um, so great job, everyone. Um, I think your, uh, you know, your detective skills are well honed. Um, I would just add the one thing that we thought was really interesting about her case was she seemed to deteriorate following that CT scan of her chest that we got, and we sort of linked it to that iodine contrast load that she had got received as part of that scan. So remember, um, those uh, iodine uh, contrast mediums that we give patients, it's particularly in the patients who have um, some sort of underlying thyroid, uh, like a thyroid toxicosis going on, like our patient clearly did, it can actually exacerbate them, which is how we sort of linked her more acute uh, deterioration following the CT scan. Yes, I think, you know, that's uh, really one of those nice points that kind of clinches the diagnosis. And we should have thought about that, but we actually missed it. And, you know, now in the concluding section, I would just ask Dr. Thiago to, you know, kind of unmute himself and just share his final approach once. Like, this is an endocrine problem and how we could approach this in a better manner next time. So, you know, Kirtan, uh, the reason I come here as much as I can, it's because I want to learn how to think, because after you are a specialist, you are kind of biased. So every time I come here, I think about those oh, thyroid, but you know, because that's what I do as a specialist, I have to rule out uh, a uh, endocrine disease. But you know, when you see a patient like this one, being an endocrinologist, uh, we have to think about thyroid. Every time you have an arrhythmia, it, uh, it can be caused by teratoxicosis. And uh, here we have a case that she presented with, uh, you know, this, tachycardia, she was not feeling well. And, uh, you know, as, as Hafa said at the beginning, uh, when you have shortness of breath, you have to think about anxiety, you have to think about lung, you have to think about the lungs, heart, but also systemic disease. And the systemic disease is thyroid is something to think about. Uh, and, and, you know, when you have a teratoxicosis, you have, often you have high output heart failure. So here, probably it's a heart failure. And that's the reason she came to the ER uh, again. And then she will have a problem because of the iodine overload, uh, because of the volume. And also it can have the, the jaw uh, based uh, effect in which you have more iodine and then you have more hormones as Caroline said. Uh, interesting, uh, in the elder, you know, teratoxicosis in younger patients, in young patients, almost always it's very symptomatic and they present in, in the, not in the emergency room, but in the office and they are feeling bad. But it, when they are elderly, they can have like this apathetic hyperthyroidism in which they were like depressed because you expect a patient with thyroid toxicosis to be agitated, but it's not the case for the elderly. So it's very common to see those elderly in which they are, are, are actually depressed and they have thyroid toxicosis. It's something to keep in mind. And uh, as for the next step, you have to, to see if it's a thyroid storm, like the, the birch wart of scale, uh, and also what is the etiology? Because the most common etiology is Graves' disease, but not at this age. At this age, it's more common to have a uh, mood nodular uh, goiter producing hormones. So uh, mood nodular goiter disease is a cause that is important at this age. And so you have to find a theology. It will, wouldn't change the immediate treatment, but it can change the, the, the intermediate term and long-term uh, treatment. And I talked a lot, sorry. Sure, yeah, thank you so much for that. And I really appreciated how you mentioned that the patient has this you know, grief and everything. And we know that sometimes when you lose your near and dear ones, you can get the grief reaction. But sometimes you have to think that what if there is underlying problem, which is, you know, kind of making that grief process worsened. So endocrinologic problems like, you know, Cushing's additions and thyroid disorders always comes to our mind. So I guess that was another point that I would take home from today, that if we have some grief reaction, we maybe have to, you know, find the underlying cause for it. And then maybe you could move ahead. And now, uh, friends, uh, we, you know, Dr. Carolyn has kindly agreed to answer some of the questions that you may have regarding their program. So if you have some questions, then please share them in the chat. And then we would ask you to kind of unmute yourself and ask them to Dr. Carolyn. And meanwhile, I can ask Dr. Carolyn that how the patient did, like what was the further workup? Was the patient stabilized later on? What happened? 
Yep. So this patient actually ended up having Graves' disease. Um, her antibodies were positive. She was started on blocker therapy and methimazole and uh, diuresed for the volume overload that she presented during that acute hospitalization. She was maintained on methimazole for almost a year, um, but overall wasn't doing well. So she had radioactive iodine ablation therapy and is now um, on uh, thyroid hormone replacement therapy. Um, she was in fact also diagnosed with lung cancer and is, and is undergoing therapy for her lung cancer, which was diagnosed at the same hospital stay. But she seems to be doing well. Thankfully. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Thanks for sharing that update. Okay. Can I just mention another thing? Thank you, Caroline, for, for giving her outcome. And it's a great outcome. So that's a good point of having teratoxicosis. But just uh, to mention that few chromocytoma, uh, people discuss it a lot in the chat. And it's good to think about few chromocytoma. But, ju but just know that when you think about few chromocytoma, it's not few chromocytoma. When you think about it, and it, like if you have even the triad, uh, over 95% of the case, they are not full chromocytoma. Just, so just make this work up after, you know, you know it's not more common diseases like teratoxicosis. Sure. Thanks for sharing that part. And you know, before we move ahead, I would like to thank everyone who has participated today in the chat. I mean, as Dr. Caroline mentioned, that the collective wisdom always is very important for the patient care. So we were able to diagnose this condition very early on because of the collective wisdom of the chat. So thanks to everyone for participating. And uh, since we don't have any question in the chat regarding the program, maybe I can ask Dr. Caroline one collective question that what has been the best part so far being at the, you know, this Selim hospital? Like what is something that you cherish most? Oh, I think it's what you cherish most wherever you are. It's the people. The people are the, the magic sauce that makes the place sort of special and um, it sounds corny, uh, Tiago probably knows this from <laughs> interviews at our program, but I always tell everyone, you know, when you're interviewing for residency or fellowship or a job or wherever, you know, go with your gut on how people feel and how people are interacting with one another, because that will let you know what, um, what the feeling is there. And I remember when I, when I interviewed at Salem, I just felt like it was this huge family. And, and the nice thing about Salem is, again, we're a small program, so everyone gets to know each other very closely. Um, and that is also reflected in how we know everyone at the hospital too. And so I'm friends with not just my attendings, but also with you know the environmental service workers or the cafeteria attendants, et cetera. And um, that has made training at Salem just a complete joy. And I'm already nostalgic at thinking that I have to leave in the summer. So, yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. I think, you know, we experience the same feeling that you have every day. Like we have all these people from around the world joining together for, you know, the similar thing that is learning medicine and how to be better for our patients. So thanks for echoing that. And now, since we don't have any other questions uh, in the chat, maybe, you know, I can ask Dr. Rabi once again, now, since we have concluded the case, like what are his remarks and what are his thought process of, you know, problem representation, illness script, and what were some of the typical and typical findings? So please, Dr. Rabi. Oh, you are way, way too kind. Um, Caroline, I just want to thank you. I'm sorry I don't have my video on. I'm going for a quick walk because I have, I get the occasional migraine headache which I had before we started. Nothing fixing in the outdoors. But um, I just wanted to say that, um, one, I think you expertly presented this case, and, but more importantly than that, um, I think that you told a story that really made for a very engaging discussion. And um, in retrospect, I think the marked worsening after the CT scan is yet another clue. And I really appreciate you emphasizing that. I think it reminds me how important it is to consider this, not as Tiago was saying, not rare diagnosis, uh, but not common diagnosis of thyrotoxicosis before you get a CT scan, because the TSH, at least in my hospital, comes back. Uh, within an hour, um, and that will change your management. So that's my practical reflection. And I think my uh, clinical reasoning reflection is to remember that while we classify anemia, acidosis, hyperthyroidism, neuromuscular weakness, anxiety, deconditioning as extra thoracic causes of shortness of breath, they can actually leave the, their imprint on the thorax. So you can have anemia cause high output cardiac failure, you can have neuromuscular weakness cause atelectasis. You can have um, thyroid disease cause heart failure. So you still have to consider those extra thoracic causes of shortness of breath, namely the top of the pyramid, even if there is a thoracic signature. So medicine is complicated and very tough, um, but I am 
humbled to try to get better from the wisdom that Caroline brought to us today. Thank you so much. And I think we have our first question. So like Tiago was asking, like, can you, you know, share a little bit more about the educational experiences which are present at the Salem Hospital? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So um, similar to what we just did here, we have a morning report like this that we have with the residents every day, Monday through Friday. Um, we also have a second didactic time every afternoon uh, that is more faculty led sort of lectures on a topic or skills based workshops um, to improve your communication and procedural skills, etc. Um, additionally, we have uh, monthly morbidity and mortality conferences that the residents help prepare on on cases that we see, um, as well as journal club. Um, and I would just say people are just very interested in, in some of the cool cases that we see at Salem. I think Salem is also great because not only do we get really good exposure to what you know we consider sort of bread and butter, internal medicine, heart failure, COPD, et cetera, but we also serve a very diverse community. Um, lots of immigrant communities from the Boston suburbs come to our hospital. And so by virtue of that, we get to see a lot of interesting pathology as well. Um, I was thinking about bringing one of those cases <laughs> here today instead. Um, so I think it's just a, a really great sort of overall uh, training place uh, if you're if you're considering residency, especially in internal medicine, and you want to see a little bit of everything. Salem definitely fits that bill. Thank you so much for sharing. No, it seems like Car yeah. please can, go can ahead. I? Yes, as, as people here, so they people who are often here with us, uh, they like this education experiences, and uh, so. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the experience a resident would have with medical students or medical residents for from other services uh, at Salem? Yeah, absolutely. So definitely one of the things that I love most about Salem is we have a really close relationship with uh, Tufts University Medical School. And so basically year round, you're likely to be working with one to two medical students from Tufts on your team. Um, and that just makes for so much of a rich uh, learning environment. And also it gives you the opportunity to practice your clinician educator skills, if that's something that you're particularly interested in, which I'm sure many of the people on this are. Um, so I think that that's really great to have is, is those medical students that are always with us, always eager to learn from us. I'll never forget my first day as an intern. I was so completely overwhelmed with everything that was going on. And I was on the cardiac telemetry floor. And my lovely fourth year medical student came up to me with a really complicated EKG and said, can you explain this? And I was like, oh, God, not today. But that's sort of the, the, the kind of challenge that you're up against sometimes is, you know, if you don't know something, you got to look it up because someone else is, is depending on you, which makes you a better clinician and a better educator, I think. Um, so that's definitely something that, that we have at Salem. Uh, the other thing that also sort of, I think, bolsters our own training is the fact that we don't have other residency programs at our hospital. Right now, it's just the internal medicine program. And so that means that really you have to become comfortable with managing a wide range of, of, of complications of pathology, et cetera, with your patients, because while you can get a consult, it's not like there's that immediate availability necessarily all the time. Um, so really being able to um, practice and, and get comfortable with your skills uh, as sort of like a jack of all trades is something that we also we also get to do at Salem. Yes, sure. It sounds like, you know, like your program kind of prepares you very well for becoming a competent physician, a little bit of everything. And even, you know, the family like feel the warmth and support that you need to grow in this field and, you know, keep on that passion and inspiration and motivation that you require. So thanks for sharing that, Dr. Carolyn. And I guess now we don't have any other questions and we are also nearing the end of time. So uh, if anyone doesn't have any concluding remarks, maybe we can conclude this. And again, thanks to Rafa for subscribing. Thanks to Shema for doing the teaching points. And thanks to all the chat for participating. And special thanks to Dr. Caroline for bringing us an amazing case. We we'll definitely remember this. We will try to make sure that we get better at this. And next time we figure out at how third oxyposis can leave you know, permanent imprint on your heart, as Dr. Ravi mentioned. So thank you so much, my friend. And have a great Sunday and have a great rest of the Saturday as well. Thanks Same for having me, guys. Today. This was so fun. The teaching points, I think so, right? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. 
I will make it fast. So we have a patient presenting with shortness of breath. So we always consider heart, lungs, and blood. And as we have heard that this patient's symptoms started after the loss of her son, we were also thinking about grief associated cardiomyopathy, so also thinking of Takotsubo. And um, we were also thinking because she had weight loss that maybe her weight loss could be grief associated. Uh, since she also presented with weight loss, we, were, we also know uh, weight loss um, is, uh, is very often accompanied by decreased appetite. And there are some several causes that can present with increased appetite, as mentioned, like thyrotoxicosis, diabetes mellitus, malabsorption, and drugs. And for thyrotoxicosis, um, that's a very nice pro presented. Always think of, a, uh, of an elderly patient presented, presented with an apathic or depressed mood, like in contrast to a younger patient who is presenting more symptomatic, so rare, mostly agitated. And also some symptoms that were mentioned for thyrotoxicosis, think of weight loss, hypertension, which was also present, uh, pre, uh, present in this patient, also palpitations, tachycardia, and also a nice pearl uh, mentioned by Sammy that um, um, thyrotoxicosis um, can present with time in the deficiency. So always um, uh, consider of time and repletion in these patients. And um, also, um, uh, we were also thinking about cardio symptoms that are uh, presenting with thyroid toxicosis. So um, it can cause high output um, heart failure. And also for the reasons for hypothyroidism, in young patients, uh, think of Graves' disease, and in elderly patients, it's more common that it's goiter induced. And since this patient uh, had uh, uh, 50 pack years of uh, cigarettes uh, smoking, we were also thinking about any kind of malignancy, so uh, which could cause hypercoagulability and, and uh, could um, have lead to a pulmonary embolism, as we know from the uh, Virchow's triad. And, and since this patient also had pulmonary freckles, considering blood plus and water as causes, and also edema, where we have the system's heart, liver, kidney. And this patient was also hypertensive. So um, reasons for our secondary cause of hypertension can, could be kidney related, like due to the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone systems, like any kind of uh, glomerulonephritis, chronic kidney disease. And also we were considering uh, pheochromocytoma or acromegaly or as we also mentioned, hypothyroidism as causes. And this patient also was also hypoxemic and non-responsive to nasal cannula. So also consider a ventilation perfusion mismatch, any kind of nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal obstruction. And maybe this patient didn't get enough uh, oxygen. So change the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the method of oxygen supply. And also in this uh, CT, we had uh, some ground glass opacities. We also know what, what are causes, blood like uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, uh, pus like infections, inflammation, as I mentioned here, CMV, PJP, COVID, and also water like heart failure related, which was here the case. We, we mentioned like a high output heart failure due to tyrotoxicosis and also protein was mentioned. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Shema. And you know, I wanted to mention this very briefly that this is the first time Shema is doing anything on CV you know, like her teaching points. So can you imagine she is doing this for the first time and how eloquently she did? So thank you so much for that, Shema. And I again apologize, I actually forgot to do the teaching points before signing off, but now I am glad that we have the teaching points. So take care, everyone, and hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>